with uh, the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Her Excellency Ambassador Molly Rifi. Hosting Her Excellency's first public speech on US Africa policy after her recent travel to Africa with the Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is befitting Howard University's long-standing and fruitful engagement with the African continent and the global African diaspora, going back to the era of national liberation struggles. Long before then, however, Howard had been teaching African studies, dating back to William Leo Hansberry's introduction of African history courses in the 1920s, courses that became extremely popular and appealing. Stemming from that historic tradition, Howard University, the Howard University Department of African Studies was created in 1953, first as a graduate program and later as a full-fledged academic department, making it one of the oldest of its kind in the United States, and currently the only one that offers BA, MA, and PhD degrees specifically focused on Africa. Today, Howard University has over 85 faculty doing Africa-related work across 12 colleges in the sciences, architecture, engineering, law, medicine, allied health, communications, education, and social sciences. We are among the 10 leading research universities that produce PhDs on Africa in the United States. Howard University has a diverse student body representing more than 100 countries around the world and particularly from Africa and the Caribbean. The Center for African Studies has been in existence for eight years and it is a Title VI National Resource Center in the past eight years, it has exponentially grown Howard University's African Languages program and now trains more, more American students in African languages than any other university in the United States. Last year alone, the center had over 800 student registrations across seven African languages that we teach at our university. Last month, the Department of African Studies and the Center for African Studies, in partnership with other academic units at Howard University, HBCUs, and in African universities, organized a Pan-African Symposium with some 200 participants, the symposium was virtual, 200 participants from across the United States and Africa, the Caribbean and elsewhere, including over 40 scholars who are from 20 US and African universities and research institutions. The symposium also benefited from the insightful inputs of academic executives, members of the African Diplomatic Corps, and our graduate students. The symposium was designed to enable scholars, researchers, high education executives, and policy experts from Af the African continent and the global African diaspora to critically reflect on the challenges and opportunities that the COVID-19 pandemic has created for higher learning and research in Africa, the Caribbean, 
and in the African American community more particularly. It was also to enable the participants to explore innovative ways in which institutions in these global African regions can collaboratively utilize te digital technology and improve teaching, learning, and research. From that forum, we are now working towards the establishment of a Pan-African Digital Consortium that will enable participating HBCUs, African and Caribbean universities to accomplish this mission in a timely manner. Against this background and much more, we are honored and proud to host Her Excellency, the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs at Howard University. And now it is my honor and privilege to introduce the Provost and Chief Academic Officer of Howard University and invite him to give the welcoming remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Anthony K. Wooter. Good morning, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, and it's especially my honor and our pleasure to welcome our students uh, to this program. We are honored to host Ambassador Fee uh, for a number of reasons, um, certainly because Howard University was founded in 1867 and nearly since the inception of the university, we have had a strong relationship and commitment to Africa and to the people of the African diaspora. And so it is certainly a pleasure to welcome you, Ambassador Fee, in our discussions on the way here. You, you mentioned that this was your first visit to Howard University, and we certainly hope that it will not be your last visit. Um, but I also want to, to thank and congratulate Dr. Krista Johnson, um, who leads our Center for African Studies and Dr. Kamara and his role as chair of the Department of African Studies. Howard University, as I mentioned, was founded in 1867, and we have always had a strong commitment to people of the African diaspora. As Dr. Kamara mentioned in the 50s and in the, as we were approaching the end of the colonial period, a number of African leaders were educated and trained at Howard, including uh, the first president of, of Nigeria and leaders uh, from various Caribbean countries. And so we certainly want to continue in that vein. We are proud to host the Wrangle, the Pickering and the Payne um, programs. And as I stand here and look to my right, um, and this framing um, highlights our Ralph Bunch International Affairs Center, it reminds me of Dr. Bunch, uh, who was not only a faculty member here at Howard University, but was the founder of the Department of Political Science and, and committed his life to foreign service and to, to creating a better world for all people. And so not to belabor my, my stay here, but I thought it would be fitting um, for me to close with a quote from Dr. Bunch. And he is quoted as saying, the well-being and the hopes of the peoples of the world can never be served until peace, as well as freedom, honor, and self-respect is secure. Peace is no mere matter of men fighting or not fighting. Peace to have meaning for many who have known only suffering in both peace and war must be translated into bread or rice, shelter, health, and education as well as freedom and human dignity. A steadily better life, if peace is to be secure, long suffering and long star forgotten peoples of the world, the underprivileged and the undernourished must begin to realize without delay the promise of a new day and a new life. And so I am pleased to welcome Ambassador Fee because these are some of the same precepts that have marked her life and her career as a diplomat she served, as was mentioned, in Ethiopia before she was appointed by President Obama to serve as ambassador to South Sudan. 
And so she is certainly a friend to Africa. Um, she understands um, the intricacies of, of African nations, uh, and she serves in a role representing the U.S. government and the people of the United States throughout Africa. And so in the spirit of Ralph Bunch, we certainly want to welcome you to Howard University, and we look forward to uh, the comments that you are going to make during this engagement. And I, I certainly hope that our students uh, will take advantage and will appreciate um, both what Ambassador Fee will share, but also the opportunities that this may represent that you could have uh, in a career in foreign service as well. Thank you again and welcome to Howard University. Well, I want to add my welcome to the in-person audience and those of you watching online. My name is Krista Johnson, and I'm the director of our Center for African Studies here at Howard University. And it's my pleasure to introduce the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Mary Catherine Fee. She's better known as Molly Fee, uh, who's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service with the rank of Minister Counsel and was sworn in as the U.S. Assistant Sec Secretary of State for African Affairs on September 30th, 2021, so very recently. Assistant Secretary Fee joined the U.S. Foreign Service in 1991. She began her career in Amman, Jordan, and also worked at U.S. embassies in Cairo, Egypt, and Kuwait City, Kuwait. From 2011 to 2014, Assistant Secretary Fee served as the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. She then served as Chief of Staff at the Office of the Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan, and was then nominated by President Obama to become Ambassador to South Sudan in 2015, a position that she held until 2017. She most recently served as the Deputy Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation. And during her distinguished career of over 30 years in the Foreign Service, Assistant Secretary Fee has received numerous awards, awards and recognition. She's a native of Chicago, a graduate of Indiana University, and holds a master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. She's also fluent in Arabic. We're very delighted to have you join us this morning, Assistant Secretary uh, here at Howard University and look forward to your remarks and our engagement. Thank you. Good morning. Let's see, I'm, I'm short, so I, I have to adjust that. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for the warm welcome here. Um, I'm a longtime district resident, so I have walked the streets around Howard University, but I've never had the opportunity uh, to come inside and see the buildings. So thank you. And, and the buildings are impressive, but it's the spirit of the people who have been here and who are here, uh, which is so encouraging and inviting. So thank you for having me here today. I also want to thank you, Dr. Johnson, the provost, Dr. Kamara, for the thoughtful and informative uh, introductions. I learned a lot listening to you, and I hope that the students who are here with us uh, in person and virtually also enjoyed uh, those discussions. Um, today, I'm really excited to have an engagement with you as we think about the future of US-Africa policy. Um, I'm, of course, really excited to come first to Howard University uh, so early in my tenure and my assignment. Uh, because Howard is truly one of the capital's jewels. Uh, the Center for Africa Studies and the African Studies Department at Howard are, as, we, as was discussed, among the best in the nation. And uh, we at the State Department and I personally have long admired your tradition of debate and dialogue and the scholarship of Howard students and faculties. And I think many of you know that Howard alumni play an important role in US foreign policy in the US government. And I hope, as the provost said, that my presence here today will encourage some uh, Howard graduates to think about a career in the State Department. And I'd be delighted to, to talk about that. As also was mentioned last month, I joined Secretary Blinken on his first trip to the continent as Secretary of State. We traveled to Kenya and to Senegal and to Nigeria. And when the secretary was in Abuja, you may have seen the speech that he delivered 
at the headquarters of ECOWAS. Uh, ECOWAS is a group of, of course, 15 Western um, African countries uh, that focuses on political and economic challenges in, in West Africa. At, in his speech, Secretary Blinken articulated a principle that defines the fresh approach of the Biden-Harris administration to US policy in Africa. Simply and directly, he acknowledged that the United States can no longer expect to advance our global foreign policy priorities without the partnership of African governments, institutions, and peoples. He said, and I quote, Africa will shape the future, and not just the future of the people of Africa, but of the world. That's an exciting proposition, and it's my responsibility in partnership with my extraordinary team at the State Department and across the US government to try and ensure that US policy meets that challenge. In my remarks this morning, I'd like to discuss how what happens in Africa matters to the United States and how what we do together affects our shared peace and prosperity. I'll focus on activities in five sectors. First, health. At home and in Africa, one of our most urgent shared challenges is ending the COVID-19 pandemic and strengthening health security so that we are better prepared to respond to future outbreaks. The African Union and Africa CDC have been global leaders in developing a comprehensive plan to purchase and distribute COVID-19 vaccines across the continent. In support of that plan, the United States has sent more than 90 million doses to 48 African countries, along with more than $1.8 billion in COVID-19 assistance to prevent virus transmission, to improve case management, and to distribute emergency food and humanitarian assistance. But we share the goal of Africans who want to move from recipient of vaccines to manufacturing powerhouses. That is why through the Development Finance Corporation, the United States is now supporting efforts by South Africa and Senegal to produce the first African manufactured COVID-19 vaccine. We look forward to seeing these countries and others develop into thriving pharmaceutical hubs. The recent outbreak of the Omicron variant illustrates that what has been done so far is important, but not nearly enough. We all benefited from the quick action by South African scientists to identify and report the new variant. Their work and transparency are a model for the world. Out of an abundance of caution, the US government imposed temporary country-based travel restrictions to buy time to conduct a scientific review of the severity and spread of the Omicron variant. We understand that these restrictions are causing real difficulty for those in South Africa and nearby countries and look forward to a timely adjustment of our travel policies. We are learning from this pandemic. We know that viruses don't respect borders so that the only long-term solution is to vaccinate people everywhere across the world. We will continue to work with our African partners until we can put this pandemic behind us and improve the collaboration between our health systems. Second, the economy. The COVID-19 pandemic is not just a health crisis, it has caused an economic crisis here and abroad. Many African countries experienced their worst economic downturn in more than 25 years due to the pandemic. Although GDP growth for the continent as a whole is projected to hit 3.7% this coming year, we will continue to look for ways to support Africa's economic recovery. One important example is American backing for the decision to suspend the debt of 32 African countries. After his trip to the region and exposure to the priorities of our partners, Secretary Blinken charged us with strengthening our commercial diplomacy so that American and African businesses small and large, do more business together across all sectors. He urged us to accelerate efforts to fill the infrastructure gap that holds back many African economies by mobilizing foreign investment capital through the Development Finance Corporation, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and the US private sector. We are also working to expand opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprises, women-owned businesses, and diaspora investments. This week, the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area is visiting Washington for his first time. Africa is expected to become the fifth largest trading bloc in the world, and we want to be their partner of choice. I want to stress that we do not seek to limit African engagement with other countries. Our goal is to offer better deals 
that reflect America's competitive advantages and our values, and, and deals that create new opportunities for U.S. businesses. Expanding Africa's economic power is good for Africans and for Americans. We also need to look around the corner when Africa's young people will be the global workforce of the future. Third, the environment. Another area of common challenge is responding to the climate crisis. We understand that the catastrophic impact of the climate crisis is not an abstract concept in Africa, but a physical reality affecting lives and livelihoods now. Deforestation, drought, food insecurity, and rising sea levels are just a few of the effects Africa is experiencing from the climate crisis they had little to do with creating. These phenomena in turn are affecting the vitality of the Earth's air, water, and ecosystems. We intend to partner with the African Union, African governments, and African societies to support climate adaptation projects to help Africans respond to these dangers, seeking to help those directly endangered on the continent, as well as those of us indirectly affected. To reduce emissions, we will continue to support renewable energy and what is known as green tech. We are proud of the Power Africa program, which has brought electricity to more than 88 million people in Africa since its launch in 2013, and 80% of that power generation is based on renewable energy. Fourth, conflict. The United States plays an important role in promoting peace and stability in Africa. We recognize that millions of Africans grapple daily with growing insecurity from crime, violent extremism, and internal armed conflict. We engage diplomatically with African, regional, and international leaders and institutions to reduce or end conflicts in African countries, such as Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, Mozambique, Cameroon, and Mali, because violence in these places steals the future of Africans. These conflicts have given rise to terrible atrocities, such as gang rape and ethnic targeting, and created humanitarian disasters like child stunting from malnutrition and forced displacement of millions of people. These conflicts set back development and fuel cycles of grievance that perpetuate insecurity. We also provide assistance designed to professionalize African security forces so they can better protect their citizens, secure their borders, and cooperate with neighbors to combat common threats. When providing our African partners with training and equipment, we stress the need for concrete action to meet human rights standards and to ensure accountability for instances of abuse. We are mindful of the root causes of conflict, which include marginalization, exclusion, and lack of economic opportunity. To address these conditions, we partner with African governments, the private sector, and civil society to promote good governance and expand economic opportunity, especially for youth, women, and minority populations. The absence of peace and prosperity drives migration that is destabilizing to neighboring countries and regions. All of these sectors, health security, economic growth, climate sustainability, and peace and stability are underpinned by democracy. Last week, the Biden-Harris administration hosted a global summit for democracy. We didn't host a summit because we know, uh, because we think that our democracy is perfect. We know uh, that there is work to do at home and abroad, and we wanted to consult with other democracies about how to renew and expand inclusive, accountable, and equitable political systems that unlock potential and prosperity for their citizens. President Biden said, Democracy doesn't happen by accident. We have to defend it, fight for it, strengthen it, renew it. This is a shared struggle. This year in Africa, for example, we have been witness to the courage and determination of Sudanese civilians standing up to military pressure and to the steadfast commitment of the people of Zambia who refuse to allow widespread government restrictions on the opposition, the press, and the freedom of assembly to undermine the credibility of their presidential election. When promoting democracy, President Biden has tasked us with fighting corruption. Over his lifetime of public affairs, he has become convinced that trust in governance is eroded when leaders misappropriate public assets, engage in bribery, or undermine the rule of law. We are now working to identify how best to use government tools from the United States to support anti-corruption policies and practices. 
In addition, the Biden-Harris administration seeks to revitalize the importance of human rights in our foreign policy. We embrace this emphasis with the understanding that the United States also struggles with these challenges, especially intolerance. We do not have all the answers, but we seek to find solutions together with our African partners and other friends across the globe. I want to close by admitting to you that at times I find it challenging to talk about US policy in Africa. The continent is so vast and diverse. The history, traditions, and peoples are so complex that countless challenges and opportunities are at once exhilarating and overwhelming. The five sectors I've outlined today offer one way to organize our efforts and engagement. Another way is to focus on people, especially the youth, women, civil society, entrepreneurs, traditional and religious leaders, academics and journalists, artists and activists. As Africans strive for safety and security, demand political freedom and economic opportunity, we want to be a valued partner in their struggle and their success. From my perspective, what is new in our approach to Africa is the recognition, you might argue a belated recognition, of the strategic value to the United States of the political, economic, and cultural power of African countries and peoples. As Secretary Blinken said last month, the United States believes that it is time to stop treating Africans as the subject of geopolitics and to start treating them as the major geopolitical players they have become. Thank you very much for coming today, and I look forward to your thoughts and questions. Great. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Fee, for your remarks and again for joining us here today. Howard's campus is full of students and faculty and educators and intellectuals who are really committed to the African continent and to uh, to you know increase dialogue and engagement with uh, Africa. So I know we have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to try and and keep my list a little bit short. Let me just begin though by I guess uh, uh, tying in with I think some of the five um, I guess key themes that you outlined in your um, speech. Um, Today, we're witnessing a number of really, I think, concerning declining trends on the African continent, and especially with regards to US-Africa relations. Um, uh, we're seeing a, a decrease in um, trade between the United States and Africa vis-a-vis -vis certainly other uh, main trading partners and players uh, around the globe. China, the big you know, kind of elephant in the room, certainly the case. Um, African, or sorry, US foreign direct investment in on the African continent dropped from uh, 64 billion in 2014 to only 43 billion in 2019. So we're seeing a, a precipitous decline there. And interestingly, that's surpassed by actually remittances um, uh, to the uh, African continent, which actually increased, uh, uh, surpassed 48 billion in 2019. So some of the trends are clearly going in the wrong direction. You're seeing a lot of uh, backsliding with regards to de democracy and governance on the part of many African countries, um, uh, a resurgent kind of coup phenomena, certainly in the Sahel region, which is very worrying and troubling. But as you said as well, and I think you quoted even uh, uh, Secretary Blinken's words that the, the future is in Africa, right? And, and Africa certainly plays an important role with regards to many of the initiatives and the priorities that the United States has, let alone you know, the Biden administration, its youthful population, um, the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement, which is going to um, uh, really create the largest consumer by certainly by 2050 when when the the population really re reaches its uh, 
it's it, yeah, it's maximum. You're going to have the largest consumer population uh, uh, or population of consumers in the world on the African continent. Um, also, Africa really is the future of multilateralism. You see, it has been a very important and growingly growing important um, influential block in the UN that votes as the block in the UN. So those are all reasons why we should be more important, uh, more interested and engaged. Uh, let me just ask, though, with regards to the trade issue in particular and foreign direct investment, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that has been, I think, a real hiccup, I guess, for that for the United States government in terms of incentivizing and finding ways to encourage U.S. companies and U.S. businesses to invest on the African continent. Are there specific um, I think strategies that you that you have or that you think that we could implement to really ensure that we're not going in the wrong direction there with regards to foreign direct investment and these kind of business relationships. Well, thank you for that opening. And I, I think you, you have the same challenge I have, right? There's so much to talk about uh, in terms of what's happening in Africa and what could happen in terms of US engagement with Africans. Um, in this specific area of trade, uh, we need to do better, and I think Africans need to do better, because it will be to our mutual benefit if there is more trade and investment. Uh, during the last administration, the government, the U.S. government started a program which has the label Prosper Africa, which is a great label and was a great idea. And it was basically to resuscitate um, and reorganize the, the uh, various efforts of up to 17 US government um, agencies and organizations that have some role in contributing to advancing uh, American trade and investment in Africa. So in effect, we are trying to do a one-stop shop to make it easier first for American businesses to find a portal into Africa and to make it easier for African businesses to find a portal into the United States. Uh, so that effort is ongoing. It's not going as, as quickly as uh, someone with my impatient nature uh, would like to see, um, but because I'm impatient because the opportunity is really there and I would like to see us mobilize um, our assets uh, and our resources uh, to, to advance trade and investment. I think in Africa, there's also a responsibility to address the enabling, what is called in the jargon, as you know, the enabling environment, right? So uh, what can African uh, governments uh, do to make sure that there's predictability uh, in their uh, economies uh, and that uh, foreign businesses can operate uh, uh, prudently, if you will, in, in terms of their own uh, investment so that their exposure is not only uh, 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 lucrative for the company, but also uh, is uh, creates a sustainable uh, way of investment. Mm -hmm. um, last summer, when uh, President Biden joined G7 leaders in Europe, uh, they agreed to uh, do something which has the label Build Back Better World, uh, which you've probably heard of. And the idea there is to mobilize uh, uh, G7 investment uh, into Africa. Uh, and other countries uh, across the globe. And in particular to focus on uh, areas which are competitive advantages or comparative advantages, uh, for, for, particularly for the United States. So we're looking at investment in, in the, in the uh, environment, in the climate sector, the so-called green technologies. We're looking at investment that uh, promotes uh, women's exposure and inclusion uh, in the workplace. We're looking at digital economies. Um, so those, ty those types of issues that sort of build, build to our strengths. Uh, so I, I do, and the uh, the other I think really important tool, which is not um, uh, as big as we would like uh, it to be yet, uh, but is certainly having a, an outsized impact, is the Development Finance Corporation, mm -hmm. which is a retooled Exim Bank uh, mm -hmm. to try and, and, and mobilize capital. Um, but when I ask um, about the size of deals in Africa, I've learned that some of the challenges are it's hard to put together. Uh, a, 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 like the size of a deal, for example, that you might do in a place like India um, because of the constraints in the local environment. So that's why I think we we both sides need to work on that, on that subject. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um, my next question is with regards to um, the COVID travel. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, kind of bluntly, the question is, when is it going to be lifted? And the context, of course, of that is that there were, I think the 
majority of Africanists, you know, believe that there was dubious, you know, justification for the ban to begin with. We know now that Omicron is in more than 30 states around in the United States. It's in dozens of countries around the world. So why still a ban which only penalizes and um, uh, restricts, you know, movement and uh, access to the Southern African countries uh, remains, you know, kind of, I think, a thorn uh, in US Africa policy, not just for, you know, the Southern African countries, but I think what's interesting as well is that you're seeing this is a broader issue. Obviously, um, other African countries have taken up this issue, I'm sure, with the, the US government, but also the diaspora. Uh, you, you might not be aware, but there's a, there's a, a petition uh, an activist group online called Color of Change, and they've actually recently were disseminating a petition which was um, tar targeted really towards the media and the kind of the the narrative, uh, the kind of racist narrative of the the ban. Um, but it it um, signals that the diaspora as a as a whole are also concerned with the. Um, what appears to be the U.S. continuing to um, to uh, you know kind of structure its engagement with Africa using the same old narratives of either you know kind of a paternalistic or sometimes downright racist narratives. So. I understand obviously there's all kinds of medical reasons and kind of medical uh, uh, advice that comes into these decisions and whatnot, but obviously your office is uh, probably tasked more than any other with controlling and, and defining and, and, and making sure that the narrative is, is uh, one that we want to put out there. So the first question, as I said, just a very, you know, do you know when will the travel ban be implemented? And then what what, what is the, the you know, kind of the debates or the discourse or in the in the bureau to control the narrative so that it is not perceived as being a harsh penalty, really, vis-a-vis -vis the Southern African countries in particular. Well, thank you for raising that topic because it's clearly a concern uh, to so many in Africa and so many uh, of us here in the United States, including in, in the diaspora. First of all, let me say we recognize um, the deep um, um, uh, disturbance that the travel restrictions has had uh, in terms of economic opportunities, humanitarian opportunities. I know that people, the difficulties of travel have, have, have a real humanitarian impact on people, and we're very conscious of that. And we've had a really good dialogue um, with the African Diplomatic Corps here in Washington uh, and with um, our African partners uh, on the continent about the issue and, and, how, and how it's affecting them. You know, um, Dr. Johnson, today in the United States, we're marking 800,000 deaths from COVID. Uh, this pandemic has rocked us and has rocked uh, countries across the world. Uh, so my understanding, because of course, this is a decision uh, that the president made in consultation with his scientific advisors, is that, as I said in my opening remarks, that they took the decision to temporarily impose the travel restrictions while they while they assess the new variant and its severity um, and and how it's transmitted. Um, and so, as they uh, undergo that review, uh, we are hopeful that we'll move to a place quickly where those travel restrictions can be lifted. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my next question is with regards to the summit for democracy, then, <laughs> which just ended last week. And I mean, I guess uh, it just in terms of, uh, I guess, a, a frank question, I wanted to know how you would rate the summit, and especially in terms of its outcomes and its deliverables for Africa. Um, I think, um, again, you know, one of my concerns or one of, or I think what I would have liked to have seen more was um, an opportunity for civil society groups, especially in the diaspora, to engage with um, their counterparts on the African continent. Um, and I wonder if you can speak to maybe any opportunities, for example, to do that. So the summit for for democracy tended to be more high level. Um, I know that there was there was some civil society engagement. There was certainly a number of kind of spin off. Um, uh, conversations, et cetera, that were going that, that that took place around that. But I think one of the things or one of the areas, especially when we're talking about democracy and governance and democracy building on the African continent, is we know that that's really not um, uh, 
you know, tactfully to say, I don't, I'm not sure that the, le the leadership on that is going to happen within the political leadership, which you have as civil society groups, youth movements, activist organizations, et cetera, which really, I think, need to be empowered to, to, to really make sure that in a number of African countries, you see strides in terms of uh, democratization efforts. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we tend to see on the African continent, for example, with regards to youth movements, right, is that, uh, similar to here in some ways, is that they tend to kind of emerge and, you know, with lots of fanfare, and then they kind of quickly fizzle out. So there needs to be, and perhaps an area for US support would be to um, support and engage these grassroots movements so that they have longevity and sustainability. So in this regard, I mean, I'm thinking of and likewise, I think we have the same issues going on here in the United States, right? Our democracy is at a real tipping point as well. And I think around the world, many of the examples of democracy and many of the kind of um, models of democracy that the rest of the world is looking towards here in the United States tends to be our civil society and activist movements. Today, Black Lives Matter, but historically our civil rights um, uh, movements, et cetera, they still see that that is actually what American democracy should and could be about, right? So I wonder if there are opportunities or if there's any plans to really put, uh, facilitate, not just a dialogue, but maybe in a sustained engagement between grassroots activist groups here, particularly in the diaspora, who are oftentimes, Black Lives Matter is actually a very good example of uh, of an organization or a, a movement, really, right, which was um, founded by African Americans, but you know, first and second generation African Americans who have strong ties still to the African continent. So, are there any plans or opportunities? I know I've, I've kind of segued into, I guess, a bit of a different question because my first question was, how would you rate the Democracy Summit? And then coming from that, would could not one of the takeaways be perhaps to have more ex, uh, sustained programming around civil society engagement between U.S. diaspora groups and African diaspora groups? Well, sorry, so, African uh, civil society activist groups. No, so th it's such a, this is such a rich and important <laughs> topic. Um, for, first of all, I, I think uh, the president and the secretary themselves would would rate, if they will, uh, the summit as as a first step. Right? It, it is is not a it's not a conclusion. It's opening this really important dialogue, which you've heard President Biden speak about. He feels very personally a lot of concerns that many Americans, many of us feel, um, we're concerned about our democracy, where it's headed. Uh, the challenges we're facing and and he also frames it in terms of looking at challenges abroad in terms of author authoritarian systems and the sense that um, democracies need to do better to prove uh, to their citizens that they can deliver um, so that was part of a, a opening conversation um, you, you raise a very valid point uh, that sometimes uh, government leaders are not the best place to be the most dynamic in sort of reviving and expanding democracy. Um, but part of the summit did involve uh, governments coming with commitments, um, which they need to pursue uh, over the coming year. So we can judge and rate the summit, I think, when we look at it next year to see if, if some of those uh, commitments have been uh, delivered upon. Uh, but I, I really uh, am excited about uh, your emphasis on civil society mm -hmm. and sort of networking. Mm -hmm. I think it's not only important to have networking between Africans and Americans, but also among Africans. Mm -hmm. And what can we do to support that? And you know, um, we have, uh, we're, we talk about it so much, um, but we're really proud of the uh, Young African Leaders Initiative, right, YALI? Um, and part of what's great about YALI is that the graduates um, then become connected and go back and, and work together. And you know, we have some centers on the continent where they can uh, do some sort of programming. So I think we totally agree with the idea that you have. And from my from my perspective, uh, uh, anything we can do to expand those types of engagement is something that would be good for, for Africans and good for us. Great, great. And of course, you know, Howard was host to yes. Yali in the past and of course ho hopes and expects to be host to Yali uh, in the future. Right. Well, and I, I would say um, uh, as an observation, not as an excuse, uh, but as we see here today, as we saw in the summit um, and in my business, you know, democracy is a people business and, and COVID really impacts what we're able to do and how we're able uh, to engage. And it's great that we have technology and it can be so useful, but there really is nothing that beats uh, sitting across from somebody. Absolutely, yes. Um, let me ask this question. So, uh, 
Ambassador Thomas, Linda Thomas Greenfield and Ambassador William Burns uh, in an op-ed that they wrote just, I think, as uh, President Biden was elected. Um, they identified the lack of diversity in the diplomatic corps as a national security crisis. Uh, and one of the proposals that I know Ambassador Thomas Greenfield made was the, to, to perhaps uh, develop some kind of uh, ROTC-like program um, you know, for recruitment and perhaps alter, you know, uh, encouraging more diversity within the Foreign Service. I, I want to, and uh, we also know that, of course, the, the, um, the, um, uh, the GAO report uh, on diversity in the State Department was quite damning in terms of uh, uh, we're not moving in the right direction there. African Americans, other minorities are very much underrepresented represented, and that dial we haven't really been able to move very much. I wonder what you think about, say, um, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield's idea of an ROTC type program um, to, um, to increase and encourage diversity or other ways in which you think that we could do that which would be um, bear better fruit than, than we certainly have seen in the past. Well, first of all, I want to say I agree that the State Department's um, um, uh, diversity is entirely insufficient. It does not uh, reflect uh, American society. That makes us weaker as an institution because we don't draw on the strengths of our society. And that makes us weaker in terms of our projection abroad, in terms of demonstrating American uh, values and frankly, reality. So I, I absolutely agree that uh, we're not where we wanna be, we're not where we need to be. Uh, in terms of solutions, I think we're finding that there are many routes uh, to, uh, to achieving more diversity and that um, uh, each individual effort on its own is not going to, you know, uh, get us to where we need to be. So we, we need to look at a lot of different ways of, of improving the situation. Um, what I can tell you from the top, there is really a strong um, push that business as usual is not acceptable. We need to change our patterns of behavior and we need uh, to take specific actions to do better. Um, uh, we talk about uh, recruitment, and that's why it's one of the reasons it's exciting for me to be here. Um, I, I would really like to encourage recruitment. Um, but from my perspective, as someone who's been around for a long time, we also really need to look at retention, uh, right? So I think we have, over time, improved recruitment, but we're not keeping people. Why aren't mm -hmm. we keeping people? Is it a question of, of diversity and people not feeling uh, welcome and included? Is it a broader problem of performance management and leadership uh, in the State Department? Or is it both? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think like many complex challenges, there are many answers uh, and many solutions. Um, I, 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 you know, uh, I'm uh, one of the people who adore Ambassador Thomas Greenfield. Um, I think an ROTC type idea is a really great idea. Uh, there's a lot more that we should do as a society and as a government. Um, but I, I just want you to know that I, I feel very strongly, and I've been around for a long time, that Secretary Blinken and his team are really committed uh, to trying to do what is different. You know, he's appointed for the first time. Can you believe it? In 2021, it's the first time we've had a, a, a diversity officer, right? And he's charged each of us, each assistant secretary and his undersecretaries uh, with really seeing what we can do to take this forward. So I, I open and invite people to offer suggestions because we haven't done enough um, and we need to continue to, to really focus on this issue. Great. I think I'm going to take this opportunity to bring in some of our students, uh, if that's possible. <laughs> see how well I okay. Can do this. Are we able to get the Zoom meeting? Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, now I can see our students. Okay. I'm sorry. You can't see the students okay. behind you. Uh, and we can only see ourselves there, fortunately. Maybe if you can okay. a little bit, okay. if you don't mind. Not I'm sorry. Um, great. So we're joined by a few students, um, as I said, Hi. on Zoom, and then a few students who, who a couple of, uh, uh, I know, participants in the audience as well. Um, let me begin with, with um, Tyler. Smith, if you could please introduce yourself and, and, and ask your question of Assistant Secretary Fee. Hello, and thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Fee, for being with us here today. My name is Tyler Smith. I'm an international affairs major, computer science minor, sophomore from Prince George's County, Maryland. 
Um, I'm very interested in Sino-African relations. And right now we see that China-Africa bilateral trade has been increasing for the past 16 years. Specifically in the digital sector, we see Chinese companies like Huawei and the Transion Group resp um, being responsible for much of the digital infrastructure and smartphones being used in Africa. Um, so my question is, in regards to digital economy, what do you think is causing African countries to choose Chinese investment rather than American investment? What is the U.S. doing to maintain its trade relationships and digital economic influence in Africa? Hi, Tyler. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, may I congratulate you on your area of focus. I think it's super timely and uh, will be very important uh, to the United States and to Africa uh, in the years to come. Uh, so. Uh, as you know, one of the reasons uh, Africans choose uh, Chinese investment is because it's available and it uh, comes on terms, particularly initially, uh, that seems easy and accessible. Um, I have confidence uh, that if Africans have the choice to choose American technology or uh, basically American products or services in, in any sector, uh, that we would be competitive uh, and, and we would be welcome uh, uh, to engage. So what we need to do in the United States is be better at um, helping our businesses uh, uh, have availability and access and entry uh, into African markets. And that's what Dr. Johnson and I talked about a little bit earlier, what more the, the United States can do to organize itself to assist our businesses uh, to engage. Uh, we are also focusing on how specifically in the digital sector, um, how we can encourage African governments to protect themselves from predatory Chinese practices in that sector uh, and, and to make sure that, uh, uh, again, American uh, products and technology are available as alternatives. Uh, so that is an area that uh, we recognize is important to Africans and important to us. There's also uh, the question of cybersecurity. Um, I learned this morning that you all have had a real challenge uh, this year. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think that's gonna be an uncommon experience. Um, and we wanna create conditions in Africa where Africans don't experience threats like that. Um, so uh, congratulations again on the, on the focus. I think it will be uh, very important for Africans uh, in the near term. But uh, don't, don't ever uh, 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 be reluctant to bet on the United States. I think, I think we'll be okay. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Allison Taylor, may I ask you to introduce yourself and ask a question of the Assistant Secretary? Sani Monani, Assistant Secretary Fee. Iga Malami U Allison. We thank you for being here with us today to discuss US Africa policy under the current administration. So Sia Bonga, we thank you. I'm a foreign languages and area studies fellow specializing in Isi Zulu and a PhD student in African studies here at Howard University, focusing on public policy and development as it pertains to the cultural and creative industries role in peacekeeping and gender-based conflict prevention and resolution. Here at Howard, we're exposed to the longstanding historical, but also contemporary ties between the US and the continent of Africa. Many of these ties emphasize the cultural and creative relationship as a binding force that strengthens US-Africa relations. For example, the Basketball Africa League and the NBA, or the Pan-African Film and Television Festival of Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. Africa is the youngest continent in the world uh, with an increasing population. In the coming years, Africans are expected to make up more than 40% of the world's youth. The future is African. It is pertinent to tap into, invest in, and support various sectors in the continent like the creative and cultural industries. My question then to you centers on US-Africa policy toward cultural diplomacy and the idea of leveraging soft power to strengthen the US-Africa relationship and empower African countries to claim what many call the African century. I know you recently traveled with Secretary Blinken to Kenya, Nigeria, and Senegal. Can you share your experience there with us and what US-Africa policy looks like regarding the importance of cultural diplomacy? Thank you. 
thank you very much for that um, opening and for the description of your studies and your interests. And I really admire your use of language. As you know, uh, being able to speak uh, uh, in, in someone's language is one of the most direct ways uh, to really open a genuine dialogue and to move forward. Uh, cultural diplomacy is so vital and important uh, to what we do. And it's an area where I think uh, we can only expand uh, and we should and we, and we should expand. I wanted to tell you before I traveled with Secretary Blinken, I went myself on my first trip to Ghana, uh, for, of course, uh, to mark and recognize and honor Ghana's uh, leader in the decolonization movement. Um, and but I also went to Ouagadougou and I was there during the film festival, mm -hmm. but they didn't let me watch films. They told me I had to work and do meetings. So that was a bit of a, a disappointment, but I was really happy to be there at that time to recognize and honor uh, that that cultural uh, phenomenon that uh, that we see uh, in Burkina. Um, so I uh, I I would challenge you to challenge us uh, to see what more we can do in this space. As a as a government, we may not be best placed uh, to. We can we have you know uh, historic programs. Uh, we have programs like arts in universities, which draw on uh, diaspora art or African art. Uh, we have programs where we bring artists to the United States or bring American artists to Africa. Um, we have exchanges uh, electronically. Um, there, so there, and we have scholarships. So we have a lot of types of activities, but I, I don't know that the activities that, that the US government sponsors are really commensurate with the talent and diversity and excellence of, of African art. Um, so I, I think that's an area where we would welcome advice from outsiders on how to do better, uh, to draw particularly on the talent of the diaspora in the United States to, to, to strengthen these pre-existing linkages. You didn't mention literature. Um, I'm, a, I'm sort of a bookworm. Uh, so I, I, I think everybody knows the amazing uh, diaspora authors um, that give us so much insight, not only into, into American culture and what it's like to be an immigrant here, uh, but into their, into their home culture. Uh, so uh, these types of programs are a really good way um, to build and deepen the bonds uh, that already exist between our, our countries and our peoples. So thank you for focusing on it and thank you for raising the question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Next, I'll turn to uh, Jean-Claude Abec. Would you please introduce yourself and ask your question of Assistant Secretary. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Ambassador Fee. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, my name is Jean-Claude Abec. I am a graduate student with the African Studies Department here at Howard. I'm also a FLAS uh, fellow, and I take Arabic. It's so exciting to hear that you yourself, you, 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 you speak Arabic. So may I say, salam alaikum. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, I, I am going to uh, focus my question uh, on security, uh, which, is, which was part of your five uh, 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 plans that you, you, you spelled out. And I, I would like to start by underscoring the fact that uh, security is a huge challenge, uh, which you, you so well uh, you know, stipulated. Uh, and partly because, especially in Africa, it's always a moving target. And, and so I want, I want to say that uh, it's something we can't take lightly. We, we appreciate the work that your office is doing. Of course, there's always areas of improvement that we could always have conversations on. Uh, and part of those challenges that I like to talk about is the, the constantly you know, evolving threats that we face. Uh, I know you mentioned issue about resurgence of coups uh, that we've seen in uh, Guinea, uh, we've seen that in Mali uh, and Sudan, but also there's also the issue of privatized warfare, which is again uh, an emerging threat. Uh, we, we've talked, uh, we can talk about the Wagner group in, in Mali and I'm sure uh, your office put out a statement uh, condemning uh, that, that, that deal, which is a very <clears throat> impressive uh, statement. But also, there's also a lot of inconsistencies that we find, uh, which that would be out of your control in terms of the changes of administration. We, we also know that in the area of counterterrorism, uh, the previous administration shifted U.S. focus in Africa to interstate uh, strategic competition instead of terrorism. And so part of my question here would be in terms of counterterrorism, uh, what, what, what is your office going to do going forward in terms of, you know, bringing maybe beefing up some of the security drawbacks that we had uh you know 2018 uh with the previous administration 
but also I wanted to be more specific. Uh, one of the countries that you mentioned in your statement was, was Cameroon, the Anglophone uh, uh, conflict in Cameroon, which is, uh, it's been going on for five years now counting. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that uh, the U.S. has uh, had a number of responses in the country, whether it's restricting, uh, actually ending AGOA, the African Good Opportunity Act, uh, but also recently we've seen uh, the visa restrictions uh, that have been put in place. Uh, Cameroon remains a, a fundamental player in counterterrorism efforts uh, with the U.S., uh, but we also see that, you know, uh, it puts the U.S. in a very tight position. So with your, with your, with your office, uh, I wanted to know what are the new and emerging, uh, uh, you know, strategies that you would be coming up with uh, to address these uh, key player in counterterrorism, but also recognizing that Cameroon, it's a, it's a gross human rights violation. Uh, uh, it's on that list, one of the top members that violate human rights. And how can you better strategize to bring Cameroon to the table in terms of finding a solution to the problem but also continue to partner with Cameroon uh, in terms of human uh, counterterrorism. Thank you. Jean Claude, thank you for such a, a, a thoughtful discussion of, of what's a, a really big topic uh, security and, and counterterrorism. So, if, if it's okay with you, I'm going to break up what you said uh, into, into two areas of, of discussion. So, first, first, let me talk about counterterrorism or terrorism, the terrorism threat, and what it means uh, for security in Africa. Um, so uh, you should know that the reason I learned Arabic is that I started my career working uh, primarily in the Arab world. Um, and as we all know, over the past 20 years, um, since 9-11, the United States has been engaged in counterterrorism activities and efforts uh, across the Arab world, also in Southwest Asia. And, and as you heard, I, I recently uh, was involved in the uh, ultimately unsuccessful effort to try and reach a political settlement uh, in Afghanistan uh, after after 20 years of conflict there. And I, I uh, those experiences have really deeply affected me uh, and how I look at these issues. And I've been looking uh, in particular recently at the challenges in the Sahel uh, and, and the fact that our efforts in the Sahel uh, and those of the Sahelian governments and peoples and other partners have not been as effective as we would hope and are now uh, threatening coastal Africa. Um, so I'm trying to uh, consider what can we learn from the 20 years of effort. Uh, and I think most individuals who've been involved in that process have come to the conclusion that a primary or in some cases a sole focus on security action, uh, military action uh, is insufficient in, in, in addressing these problems. Uh, that these problems are rooted in um, uh, often poor governance, uh, ex uh, policies of, by states that exclude uh, certain actors, certain groups, uh, certain communities um, to, uh, I, I think the problems also include uh, economic challenges, uh, environmental challenges, fights over resources uh, driven by uh, the climate change crisis. Uh, so it, it's a really, uh, and, and I and also think uh, social problems. I talked about exclusion of communities, but whether different tribes can live together, whether different religious groups can live together. Um, uh, so these, this is a, it's a really complex problem set, as you know. Uh, but the, I think the takeaway is that we need to do more than just uh, security uh, action. Security action is necessary, uh, given the 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 horrific conduct often of, of terrorist groups or violent extremist groups, but it's it's insufficient on its own. Uh, so that's one of the lessons uh, we take. And I also think we take away the lesson that we can't just keep doing the same thing and hope um, we get a different result. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you can't expect to change an environment immediately. And so uh, there is a requirement to invest in time and to uh, allocate sufficient resources. But on the other hand, you need to be honest if you find uh, that your effort isn't succeeding or is perhaps counterproductive. So, so if that's helpful to you, as, as I, when you say strategy, to me, strategy is thinking about what is our intent, what resources are available to us, what metrics do we have uh, to try and measure what we're doing and hold ourselves accountable. Uh, so that's how we're looking right now at, at, the, at, the, at the terrorist challenge in Africa and how we can be a good partner uh, to African states and societies uh, trying to restore 
uh, uh, stability um, and trying to reduce their vulnerability uh, to terrorist activity. Uh, I don't see in Cameroon uh, it as I heard a little bit of either or in your question, like because we cooperate uh, at times with the government of Cameroon on uh, counterterrorist activities that we are um, uh, somehow uninterested. Uh, maybe that's not fair to you. That's just how I heard it. Uh, that we're not interested in the uh, in the conflict, the internal conflict there, its devastating consequences, and how to find a way uh, to help the parties move forward. Um, so I want to tell you that that's something that I believe that um, I would like our our office to work on. Um, the you know bureau is the term we use at the State Department. That's something I think we need to work on. Um, I would like to see us focus more energy over over my um, tenure. Uh, to see if we can revive what are certainly right now seem to be more abundant uh, external diplomatic efforts uh, to help the parties uh, resolve uh, the conflict. Um, and particularly uh, 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 to uh, encourage the government uh, to create conditions uh, for a dialogue. So that that's something where I, I think an external push is necessary because uh, left to left right now, there isn't much of an external push and we don't see much movement. Um, so I, I agree with you that it's an area that uh, is, is having devastating consequences for the people of Cameroon um, and contributes, I think, uh, to their vulnerability in terms of uh, uh, exploitation by terrorist groups and individuals. Uh, so it, that's how I see them united, not as, a, not as an either or, if that makes sense. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Malik Ngugi uh, to please ask in, introduce yourself and ask your question of Assistant Secretary Fee. I know. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, hello, Secretary Fee. Thank you for allowing us to partake in this discussion with you today. Uh, my name is Malik Ngugi, and I'm a freshman political science and Spanish double major from Wichita, Kansas. Um, during his during your recent trip to Africa, specifically Abuja, um, Secretary Anthony Blinken said that the United States knows that that one that on the most of the urgent challenges and opportunities we face, Africa will make the difference. And I wholeheartedly believe in that, believe in that as well. One of the challenges that young people such as myself are worried about is climate change. Just recently in the U.S., we have witnessed a deadly disaster in the Midwest slash South region that may become more normalized without proper action against climate change. During the recent COP26 meeting in Glasgow, the United Nations announced such action with the Comprehensive African Climate Initiative. What type of natural disasters may become more severe in Africa without these detailed climate initiatives? And what are some of the challenges and opportunities that the U.S. and African nations see in combating this issue? Uh, Malik, thank you very much uh, for highlighting uh, this topic, um, and I'm so excited that you are here at Howard and, and thinking about it, um, and I hope you have lots of support um, from uh, your, your uh, fellow students, um, because you need to do better than the adults uh, in this country and in other countries uh, 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 to uh, make good on the threat that we're all facing. And what I was trying to highlight in my talk uh, which I think, uh, in my view, has not been emphasized sufficiently in past uh, U.S. policy discussions on U.S.-Africa relations, is how what happens here affects Africa and how what happens in Africa uh, affects here, and not only here, but uh, uh, the rest of the globe. And I think you can see that so clearly in the climate sector. Um, so I, I'm not uh, a scientist. Uh, so you could probably better describe uh, to me uh, the the economic challenge, or I'm sorry, the environmental challenges in Africa. But what I see, because I focus a lot as a diplomat on conflict, I really, I'm really concerned about the resource competition that is resulting um, from particularly desertification, um, and 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 you see that like in the Lake Chad region, um, and 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 in other areas of Africa where the um, alterations that are resulting in our ecosystems because of climate change are changing the way uh, people um, uh, who have like engaged in certain types of livelihoods for millennia uh, are operating or forced to operate. And that's 
massively disruptive to them, sort of socially, economically, um, politically. Um, so I, I, I really think what I'm looking at from my end at the State Department is how these um, these resource competitions uh, exacerbate and 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 actually generate uh, new conflicts among peoples uh, that that then create uh, problems for stability uh, and economic development. I don't I don't want to sound all negative though because I I think there's real opportunities um, to try and uh, in de- sort of match new technology in the United States and actually new technology ideas uh, from Africans uh, to try and and do better uh, in energy generation, in terms of energy generation that doesn't hurt the environment, uh, that contributes to economic development, and do better in sort of traditional sectors like mining um, so that the sort of human rights and environmental consequences uh, are not um, detrimental to local populations. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to work better there. Um, but just so you know how 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 I focus on it, I, I'm focusing on the the conflict uh, consequences of 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 the climate crisis. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malik. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to our audience and invite Renee Odanga to ask a question. I'll get, I'll get to a couple more questions as we go along. Please introduce yourself as well. Renee. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Fee, for your comments and your speech. Uh, I appreciate it very much. My name is Rene Odanga. I am a second year master's student in the Department of African Studies. Um, my question is on education. Um, you mentioned and called the, the African youth the global workforce of the future. Um, I'm, myself, I am from Kenya, so I'm an international student at Howard. Uh, I just want to start by contextualizing the situation of international education in America. Quite recently, the State Department and the uh, Open Doors Data Policy Organization released a, uh, a report stating that um, international education and international students' enrollment in the United States as of 2021, uh, enrollment has decreased by 53%. That's, of course, a, fee, a factor of the COVID crisis. Right. However, while that has been the case, uh, generally speaking, um, international students' um, um enrollment at hbcus specifically howard has increased howard for instance in the 2020 2021 academic year reported an increase of international student enrollment by 20 percent leveling off the student body international student population at 10 percent of the of the student population that population predominantly comes from africa and the caribbean and hbcus in general have had a long history of educating uh, students from 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 africa and the caribbean it was mentioned by Dr. Kamara, for instance, that the first president of Nigeria, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, went to Howard. You mentioned that you were in, in Ghana celebrating Kwame Nkrumah. He is, a, he is a graduate of Lincoln University at Pennsylvania, which is an HBCU. Um, the first president of Trinidad and Tobago, the Honorable Eric Williams, was a longtime faculty at the history department at Howard University. So while there has been a decrease um, in international student enrollment in the United States. There has been a storied increase at uh, HBCU specifically of students from Africa and the Caribbean. So we are seeing a trend where African students are saying that not only do they want to study in, Af- in, in the United States, they specifically want to study at HBCUs. Now, want as this HBCUs might owing to the realities of HBCUs in the United States, they might not have the, you know, the resource clout to do so. So what opportunities uh, is, the, is, is, the, is the United States government thinking of putting in place to encourage this? And I say this against the backdrop of historic programs that the United States has had in engagement with education in African countries, such as the 1960s Kennedy Mboya Air Student Airlift, that so very many students not just come to the United States, but also to HBCUs. So in, in, with that in mind, what, what programs do you think might be possible that the government might be considering? or already putting in place to ensure the education of not just Africans, but the African diaspora in the United States. Well, thank you for uh, speaking and for updating me on those statistics. And first of all, let me thank you um, 
for coming for choosing to come to the United States. Um, and as an American, I'm excited and thrilled uh, to see that we still attract talent such as yours. And I mean, and I mean that uh, very genuinely. Um, and as someone who's interested in, in, in foreign policy, uh, I also want to make sure uh, that uh, Africans can benefit from the educational uh, opportunities in the United States and use uh, the experiences and expertise that they acquire in their own countries uh, to help improve uh, situations back there. In terms of US government um, actions that we can take uh, to make it possible for more African students to, to, to come to the United States and study, the first you note is of course, uh, the very uh, simple and basic uh, challenge of uh, obtaining a student visa. Um, and so uh, I know that there have been serious backlogs in processing student visa applications because of COVID. And I want to reassure you and other students uh, that there's a sincere effort underway to try and address those backlogs. Uh, because everyone who works at the State Department recognizes the importance of exchanges and the importance of, 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 of allowing um, and, it, and creating an environment for students to come to the United States. And I can tell you, all of us, I think you know this, on our very first assignment, we serve as counselor officers. It's a bonding experience. So everyone, no matter what your area of expertise or focus, you start by processing visas. And the most exciting visas to deal with are student visas because everybody is excited uh, to create that opportunity. Uh, so that's an important area of focus for us. Um, in, in, in terms of US government financial support for education in the United States, that has varied over time. Uh, based on administration policy or congressional support. Uh, and I expect that that will continue to, to be the case, um, that, that depending on the different configuration of the politics of the moment of, of the US government, um, that will affect the level of, of support uh, for uh, education. But I think I can tell you that there's a strong history. You see here the Dr. Bunch program, you know about the Wrangell and Pickering scholarships, uh, you know about the Fulbright programs. So there's a strong uh, history in American governance of looking for uh, educational opportunities uh, to promote interest in foreign affairs, both from students abroad and from American students going abroad. Um, so I can tell you that uh, there is a real interest in seeing what more can be done in that space, but it will be constrained by what uh, Congress, the, our Congress is willing to support and what different administrations are willing to advance. Thank you. I'll actually just follow up on that question because it's interesting. One of the more stunning statistics that I heard recently was the fact that there are currently more or now more Africans studying at um, studying in China than there are here in the United States. I mean, I think China yep. has clearly made a strategic decision to put stop state resources the government to for the government to support africans to study over there there are long-term obviously consequences to this so obviously i mean renee is an international student but the 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 there's the larger you know kind of picture that as as we have these kind of student exchanges and engagements and whatnot china is setting up you know its future engagements between business business people e educators etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. And I appreciate that our government works a little bit differently. Perhaps we don't have the resources right. to do a completely you know, massive state funded um, uh, scholarship program. But is that I mean, are there is that completely off the table or are there not certainly other ways in which we we really recognize that this is actually a long term investment, right? Because it's not simply investing in wonderful, <laughs> might I add, um, uh, you know, students like Renee, but it's really setting the United States up to have better engagement, better partnerships and people that we can go to on the continent, you know, in the future. So, I mean, how fe fearful are you with that initial statistic that there are more Africans now, and that was never the case, right? right? More Africans now studying in China than there are in the United States. I think it's really good to discuss that kind of development um, and, and then uh, so that policymakers can consider uh, what that might mean for our own policy choices. Um, and, you know, first of all, mm -hmm. let me say, I'm really grateful that HBCUs uh, make an effort to create an environment where African students can come and flourish, uh, both historically and currently. 
Um, and I encourage you to continue to do that. And that is one of the aspects of our society that is different from Chinese society, that our academic institutions are free and independent and, and make their own decisions. Um, but we as a, as a government uh, can also uh, assist in creating an environment um, and, and mobilizing resources to, to help you do that. So I, I, I imagine there's a lot of discussion uh, on Capitol Hill on the role of China in Africa, particularly, particularly, and in generally, it's an area where I think there's bipartisan consensus uh, about concern about the threat. Um, uh, when Secretary Blinken talks about our relationship generally with uh, between the United States and China, he uses uh, the C words I call sort of. There's areas uh, where we might cooperate. There's areas where we might coordinate, and there's areas where we might be in conflict. Um, and so. Uh, uh, I think if you think uh, competition, competition might be in education. I like to think that American education is still a better value and offers better opportunities uh, for students. Um, but I, I, I think this kind of discussion is helpful to affect our policy environment and, and maybe drive uh, us to make decisions that create more opportunities in this space. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna take one last question because we're running a little bit out of time. Um, Dr. Fraser Rahim, did you have a question for? You do. <laughs> Great. Oh. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I um, I'm an alum of the department, did my PhD here, and also I worked in US government on counterterrorism issues for over a decade. So oh, good. appreciate having sound leadership back here in um, the nation's capital and, and, um, and, and a nice balanced voice with the Biden administration. Um, not going to talk about security right now, but another area that I work on too as well, which is on tech slightly. Um, particularly interested in your thoughts in the South China Sea, slightly connecting back to Africa in one second. Um, Taiwan is obviously the leader on semiconductors, uh, computer chips, um, and curious about how we can have more better public private partnerships on the African continent and finding alternative perhaps locations to provide some of those technical advanced technologies um, in working with great US businesses. So just curious your thoughts in the Africa nexus in light of just, as you know, the, 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 the tensions in the South China Sea and also obviously offering African expertise and working with US businesses as well. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. I'm I'm not really I'm going to be very bureaucratic and say I'm not going to take the South China Sea question because it's not it's not an area that I'm I'm competent to to talk about. I, I would say just generally, as you know, we support uh, Taiwan's uh, ability to oper operate freely uh, on globally, but specifically in the African continent to have its own engagements uh, with African governments and, and engagements uh, in the uh, economic sphere. Uh, as well as other types of partnerships, for example, in health, where Taiwan is really a, a global leader. Um, and we also encourage uh, Taiwan to be able to take its rightful place in UN organizations, uh, particularly the specialized in technical agencies, um, where um, Africans can play a role in creating an environment in those agencies uh, for ta Taiwan to, to play a role. Is, is that what you were looking for? Yeah, okay, great, thanks. It's very nice to see you. <laughs> I think we've... Does anyone else, I'll take, have an opportunity to take maybe one additional question if anyone has any. Dr. Kamara. <laughs> oh, now I'm scared. <laughs> Nothing scary, Ambassador. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Ambassador Rufi, uh, thank you very much. Um, as you certainly know, one of the challenges facing Africa is what is called brain uh, brain, uh, brain drain and uh, the African Union and uh, members of the African diaspora are trying to turn brain drain into brain gain and there are a lot of African uh, scholars, researchers, educators uh, in the United States in particular who have been working on giving back in terms of teaching, in terms of research, and so on. Uh, as an African who received his uh, graduate education here in the United States on a Fulbright scholarship, I'm very proud of that and thankful for the United States, to the United States. On the other hand, I'm here. And my country and Africa, 
I wouldn't say need me more than America needs me because uh, I don't I don't want to be fired. <laughs> but would there be a, an approach that the State Department, but also maybe in uh, collaboration with the, the Department of Education, could support African scholars, educators, researchers in this country to collaborate, uh, collaborate, uh, collaboratively uh, give back to Africa in terms of uh, teaching programs, engaging universities like the African Union University System and other universities where it's not piecemeal. It's not like Dr. Johnson going to South Africa, Mohamed Kamara going to, to, uh, to Guinea, uh, Provost Wuto, I'm sorry, but going to Ghana, but it's something where, for example, we can contribute in a more synergistic way to help lift and maintain African education and make ourselves the brain drain, a brain gain for Africa, and most importantly, engage African universities in the development of Africa. Thank you. Thank you for raising this topic, which I, I agree with you is, is uh, probably emotionally challenging in terms of individual opportunity um, and, and maybe uh, uh, a sense of national responsibility. Um, I, I would encourage us to think of uh, this issue as interconnectedness, right? So uh, the great thing about scholarship, it's like the great thing about reading, right? It allows you to cross boundaries and time. Uh, you can bend the time-space continuum, right, uh, in a way uh, that it can be inclusive and participatory. Um, so, how do we uh, how do we facilitate what I hear? I think I hear you saying, how how can we facilitate linkages um, between African universities and students and American universities and students? So, you know, we have a Bureau of Education and Cultural Activities at the State Department, um, which every single program of which is fabulous, and we would all like to see them multiplied by, you know, a factor of, of a thousand. Um, we were talking earlier, Dr. Johnson and I, about the difference between the Chinese and American systems, and I think that's very true if you look at U.S. universities, right? You're all independent. Like, it, there's no one model. Uh, we have land grant colleges, we have HBCUs, we have private universities, etc. Um, so they can, they're variously organized, right? But it, it's it's not a, a system which is centrally uh, controlled or, or mandated. Um, so how do we encourage linkages? Um, how do we encourage universities uh, to perhaps um, uh, take the decision to invest or engage or partner? Uh, with African universities. Can can the U.S. government, can U.S. embassies play a role in helping foster those linkages? Um, so that's we've done that type of activity in the past, but maybe not consistently um, and, and maybe not um, it, it, at, the, at the sort of level at which you might feel is appropriate or desirable. So let me take that as homework, if you don't mind me using uh, that expression, to see if there's something we might do to help uh, uh, build those linkages. But, but I can tell you that I've thought about that myself when I've been abroad at a university, and I felt a little bit personally stymied about how to reach out uh, to universities and colleges in the United States, because if I didn't have a personal connection, right, what was the mechanism or the route? So maybe there's something we can do uh, to help um, uh, encourage and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, support those kinds of linkages. Um, because I, I do think, you, in, particularly in today's world, you don't necessarily always need to be physically uh, together, but if, you, if we can create and foster these linkages where you can share research, where you can share um, uh, lectures, um, and, and, and hopefully have visits, uh, COVID and other health challenges notwithstanding, um, I, I think it would be great for everybody. So thank you for, for raising that, that topic. Uh, it, it's important, uh, to, I think, uh, for us to see what more we can do in that space. Thank you. I think we're going to have to wrap up there. We've gone a bit over time. I want to um, 
I want to thank you again, uh, Ambassador Fee, for joining us uh, uh, this morning. It's been really, I think, a very fruitful uh, engagement and discussion. And I hope just the beginning of uh, longer conversations and, and opportunities to engage with you around uh, US Africa policy. I want to invite uh, Ambas uh, Ambassador Dr. Kamara, Mohammed Kamara, to come and just g give a vote of thanks. Uh, on behalf of uh, us and uh... well, 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 thank and I, I just really want to thank all of you. I, I have really enjoyed the conversation. All of you are uh, so informed uh, and excited and committed uh, to Africa and to U.S. engagement in Africa and African engagement in the United States. So it's been really a great experience for me. And I did want to come here early uh, and invite myself to come back often. So <laughs> thank right. you, thank you, right. thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> oh wow. They're going to be jealous when I go back to the office. Yep, yep, yep. I'm done. Okay, uh, a very brief uh, closing remark. I would like uh, on behalf of the Department of African Studies, the Center for African Studies and uh, our, our institution really to thank you again, Ambassador Fee for uh, choosing Howard University to hold this dialogue on US Africa policy. Um, we are very encouraged by your informative speech and answers to the very pertinent questions from the audience, our students and uh, we really look forward to uh, long lasting collaborations with your office. Uh, and I would like to thank Provost Wuto for coming and representing the entire Howard University leadership, the Department of African Studies and the Center for African Studies are very grateful to you, Provost Wuto, for your unwavering leadership and support for all the projects and programs that we pursue for the common good of Howard University, the United States, Africa, and the global African diaspora. I also want to thank uh, all those here at Howard and in the State Department behind the scenes who have planned and made this event uh, uh, possible. So uh, I, uh, on behalf of Dr. Johnson and myself and our departments and center, I uh, would like to wish everybody uh, happy holidays, safe holidays, and thank you very much.